Hey everybody, hope you're having a good day. Uh, this video is going to be about apostolic succession, but before we even get into that, uh, I I've keep getting pulled into other things. I actually set aside this whole week to finish a writing project. I'm writing a short book on humility, a popular level, read it in one sitting kind of a book, 18,000 words. Uh, it's called The Most Relaxing Virtue. It's all about how humility, it is weird to write a book on humility because people think, why did you choose to write on that topic? Um, so, you know, uh, you, you always joke around about, well, I'm the most humble person I know and things like that. But then, the, then you worry that someone's going to take something seriously, joking like that. So <laughs> it is weird to write a book on that topic. But um, that's a popular level book. Just, to, just hopefully, you know, for pastors, Christians, it has discussion questions, very short, accessible book. I hope that'll be helpful to people. But I've carved out this week to write that, but I keep getting pulled into the uh, other things. Um, so uh, I, w I thought, okay, I'm going to make this video, get this one done, because it's been in the queue for a while. And then some of you have asked if I'm going to give a response to Jordan Cooper's two video responses to my uh, video on baptism. We are going, I think, Lord willing, I think we're going to have three dialogues. We'll do, and we've asked um, Austin Suggs uh, at Gospel Simplicity to moderate these, and they'll come out on each of our channels. So first, we'll do a discussion on the, the subjects of baptism. Basically, should we baptize infants or, or only those who make a credible profession of faith, credo baptism versus pedo baptism. Then we're going to do a discussion on the meaning of baptism, getting into baptismal regeneration and those things, and then we'll do a live Q&A. That last one will be on Austin's channel. So that's coming up, but that's not going to be until like tail end of July and August. So I think what I'll do is I'll try, if I can find time sometime in maybe early July or something like that, I'll try to do a short video that doesn't give a thorough refutation or response to Dr. Cooper's videos, but more just sort of um, hits a couple of the main points, flags some of the issues that need further discussion, uh, asks some questions, basically a, a video that tries to set us up for success for when we do our in-person dialogue, and then we can really get into the weeds. So I won't do like a moment-by-moment a -moment response video like he did, then it would get longer and longer, but I'll just do a short one trying to kind of frame some of the issues, offer a general response to set us up for our discussion. So for those of you who are wondering about that, that's what I will do on that. Okay, but um, and this summer is really filled up for me because there's a couple other dialogues, Lord willing, that I'll be prepping for, and then there's some other traveling and writing I'm trying to do. So I might there might be a little bit less videos coming out over the next. Uh, I, I'll I'll still try to do one per week, but maybe they won't be quite so heavy duty. Be shorter. This one will be shorter. I'm going to talk about apostolic succession, but I'm not going to f thoroughly address it. What I'd like to do is try to frame where I think the most interesting differences lie on this issue. Because this is one of those things that's come up a great deal uh, in my discussions with Catholic friends, Orthodox friends, and even other Protestants. Just basically um, kind of where, where are the most interesting differences that need further exploration? So uh, I won't recast the argument here that I've given elsewhere. You could check out my uh, response to my second dialogue with Joe Heschmeyer, where I, I think that video is called, Is There a Bishop in Rome in the First Century? And I'm just going through the evidence, and I'll just summarize some of the points here. Basically, I, uh, the argument I've made more fully elsewhere is if you look at the biblical, extra-biblical first century and early second century evidence, it, the, uh, this evidence indicates that there's a development in the early churches government and that it's moving towards a monarchical episcopal structure, but it's not there right at the beginning and it develops. So that's that's based upon in the Shepherd of Hermas multiple passages that reference presbyters presiding over the church in Rome and it even talks about how they relate to one another and that kind of thing. Uh, Polycarp who gives us qualifications for two offices in his epistle to the Philippians. Uh, the Didache which enjoins churches to appoint two offices, bishops and deacons, as their leaders. Uh, the first epistle of Clement, which in chapters 42 to 44, teaches that the apostles appointed two offices, bishops and deacons, and then it uses the word bishop and, de and 
presbyter interchangeably in chapter 44. And then in chapter 57, it references the presbyters uh, who are the leaders in the church in Corinth. Um, and then the entire New Testament, where you've got, in, you've got uh, consistent testimony of elders uh, or bishops, some kind of plural uh, entity over churches, whether it be Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, the bishops over the church of Philippi, or in Acts 11 and 14 and, and uh, 21 and elsewhere, where presbyters or elders are said over churches. Uh, you've got the words used interchangeably in passages like Acts chapter 20, 1 Peter 5. And then the one I like to put a lot of emphasis upon is the qualifications lists, 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, where you've got these two qualifications list for two different offices, but they're basically unmistakably parallel. And then you've got the words reverted back and forth throughout Titus 1. Appoint a presbyter if they're above reproach, for a bishop must be above reproach. And because the greater office can include the lesser, but not vice versa, when those who defend a monarchical episcopal structure come to these passages, they're trying to harmonize it, and they're trying to make it fit. And you know, it's just one of those things where it's just not the most natural reading. You have to kind of twist yourself into pretzels, hermeneutically speaking, and bend every which way to try to make it work. And it just doesn't, it's just not a natural or compelling reading. And then when you look at Ignatius, where you do see the development of bishops and his strong emphasis upon the bishop, you see that these, this really isn't the, the word bishop being used in the same meaning as what you get later with apostolic succession. He doesn't think the bishops are the successors of the apostles. He thinks the presbyters are in that capacity. And he also doesn't think of bishops as having a diocesan jurisdiction, but rather a congregational one. They're basically like what a Protestant would call a senior pastor. So all of that, I think, is just a summary of what I've argued for elsewhere, where the evidence indicates a development into the monarchical episcopal structure. Now, what I want to do here is just observe, as I've been continuing to probe this and dive into this, my profound appreciation for Roman Catholic scholars who basically acknowledge this. So I want to give a couple of examples, and then I want to use these as a way to frame, okay, here's where we should really put the focus as we keep working on this. So the first book I've been reading is by Francis Sullivan called, and sometimes I'll quote a Catholic scholar, and then I'll, Catholics will be like, oh, can you believe he, uh, he quoted so-and-so? And I'm like... <laughs> Sorry, I'm just out of ignorance. I don't know who's popular and who's not, who's controversial and who's not. You know, I've referenced Eamon Duffy. I've referenced uh, a few others. But uh, so if I'm triggering someone by quoting from the wrong scholar, I, I'm just doing it out of ignorance. I don't, I, don't, I don't know why one person, one Roman Catholic scholar is controversial among Catholics and another isn't all, all the time. So just forgive me if I'm uh, stepping on a landmine here for some reason. But Francis Sullivan's book is very good. Um, it's very fair. It's, uh, it's just honest and fair. Uh, it's called From Apostles to Bishops, The Development of the Episcopacy in the Early Church. Let me just read how he starts off the whole book, okay? This is like the second page of the book and the preface as he's setting things up. After he frames the issue, he then says, The question whether the episcopate is of divine institution continues to divide the churches, even though Christian scholars from both sides agree that one does not find the threefold structure of ministry with a bishop in each local church assisted by presbyters and deacons in the New Testament. They agree, rather, that the historic episcopate was the result of a development in the post-New Testament period from the local church, from the local leadership of a college of presbyters, who were sometimes called bishops, to the leadership of a single bishop. They also agree that this development took place in the churches of Syria and Western Asia Minor earlier than it did in those of Philippi, Corinth, and Rome. Scholars differ on details, such as how soon the Church of Rome was led by a single bishop, but hardly any doubt that the Church of Rome was still led by a group of presbyters for at least a part of the second century. The question that divides Catholics and Protestants is not whether or how rapidly the development from the local leadership of a college of presbyters to that of a single bishop took place, but whether the result of that development is rightly judged an element of the, the divinely willed structure of the church. So do you see what he's saying there? He's basically saying 
The scholars agree that this is, it's a development. The only question is, is that development of divine institution? Okay. Um, the other one I've been working through pretty carefully uh, is Raymond Brown, though I haven't finished this book. But man, it's, again, just the honesty is refreshing. He says, uh, summarizing his our argument of the data, he says the presbyter bishop, the presbyter bishops, because he's been saying that's what they are in the New Testament still, it's both terms used for one office. The presbyter bishops described in the New Testament were not in any traceable way the successors of the 12 apostles. And he goes on to summarize that evidence just like Sullivan does. And he says, the affirmation that the episcopate was divinely established or established by Christ himself can be defended in the nuanced sense that the episcopate gradually emerged in a church that stemmed from Christ and that this emerge, emergence was, in the eyes of faith, guided by the Holy Spirit. Um, I want to suggest that stemming from what Sullivan and Brown are saying, that here's where we could maybe f focus and hone the question. So I want to suggest four categories, and I'll put these up. Option number one is that the episcopate is from the first century and divine. Option number two is that the episcopate is a later development, but still divine. Option number three is that the episcopate is from a is a later development and good or acceptable, but not divine. And option number four is that the episcopate is a later development and bad, or it's a wrong form of church government. And basically my feeling is I've continued to work through this, go back to the data, read through these texts in Polycarp and Clement and elsewhere more and more carefully, try to read them with an open mind, try to consider, am I missing something? Is there another way to look at it? My basic feeling is that at the end of the day is the most interesting conversation is between options two and three. Option two is what uh, Brown and Sullivan are arguing. It's a very reasonable position. They're saying, look, this was a development, but God, the Holy Spirit, oversaw that development. And they have some reasonable arguments for that. I'm not persuaded, but that's a reasonable case. That's an interesting discussion between that and number option number three, which is where I fall, which is that it's a development, and it's not wrong, but it, also, it, it lacks, it's not divine, it lacks jura divino, or it's not by divine right. I think the views that are most difficult would be op options one and four. Uh, because if you go with option number one, it's really hard to square that with the actual evidence. And if you go with option number four, then you're forced to say that basically the entire church adopted an erroneous practice of church government by the second century and from then forward. Those are the most difficult options. I think the most interesting discussion happens between options two and three. And that's where I think the most interesting conversation going forward can be had. Is to, and that, there you get into really interesting questions of development. What kinds of development uh, are legitimate but lack Euro Divino? What kinds of development are actually divine? And that's an interesting conversation to have. But let me close this video. This is just a brief, again, brief framing type video. Let me close this video by addressing one objection that's come up and I've been thinking about it, and I thought, I, I need to say something about this. And that's the objection that basically if you're skeptical of the development of the Episcopal, monarchical Episcopal governmental model and the bishop lists we get in the late second century for the bishops in Rome, we don't have bishop lists for everywhere, but we have... Uh, lists of bishops for some churches, and the earliest ones are for the church in Rome, and they come from the late second century. And so if you're skeptical of those things, there's an association that some people make with uh, higher critical biblical scholarship that is skeptical of biblical events. And uh, I want to suggest that this, that a skepticism of the monarchical Episcopal church government structure and of these bishop lists from later writers like Tertullian and Irenaeus and others is not comparable to what we have in, you know, liberal biblical scholarship where you get... So, for example, in higher critical biblical scholarship, part of what is motivating that is a skepticism of supernaturalism. Uh, so, you know, the, if, you, if you get into it and you read why people want to date a book like Daniel or, uh, much later, or why people want to suggest there's two or even three different authors and settings for a book like Isaiah. 
much of that ultimately boils down to a skepticism that there can be valid future predictive prophecy. And that's kind of an anti-supernaturalistic bias. Or if you look at the Gospels and you're looking at uh, the Jesus Seminar type people, or you look at Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, what they're basically doing is they're taking material that we have in the Gospels and they're subjecting it to incredible scrutiny, a high level of skepticism, and that they, they have all these different, because the, the working assumption is that oral tradition is not actually reliable. And, and I think that point is vulnerable to criticism. But that's their assumption. And then so they have all these different criteria that you subject different passages in the Gospels to to see, to kind of rank their uh, trustworthiness. You know, you have the principle of, of independent attestation. So if something is in multiple Gospels independently, or if something is, in, is independently attested in multiple sources that... Or the criterion of dissimilarity is another one. Um, there, there's all kinds of criteria you can see our airmen working with those. Now, that's very different. That's a very different kind of um, critical or revisionist way of reading texts. Essentially, what he's doing is he's taking the evidence that you do have and subjecting it to this high bar of scrutiny. Um, it's, it's a very skeptical approach. It's different from what we're doing with the Episcopate because we're... Um, we're, we're not being skeptical of the evidence we have. We're noting that there isn't that evidence. Okay, we're going back to the to the early second century and saying, "Hey, Ignatius means something different by the word bishop. This is not a successor of the apostle for Ignatius." Um, hey, look at all these churches that seem to be governed by presbyters, a college of presbyters. So we're looking at the evidence. We're not trying to get around the evidence. The other way it's different is now, because trying to be fair here, we do have these bishop lists. So it is true that there's a skepticism about these bishop lists you get later. Now, the reason for that, though, is that they're very different. So if you think of like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, people usually think that the synoptic gospels are written earliest, and I think that's right. So if we think of these as written, maybe, let's just say standard time, a little on the earlier side for some, but I think this is right that they're written sometime in the 60s. Just for the sake of argument, that's a reasonable view. So there you've got basically a little over 30 years from the events in question, documents written by people personally involved or near personally involved. So, you know, Luke is doing his own careful investigation, of course, but Matthew and John are eyewitnesses. Mark is an associate of Peter, and they're written in the same area. Okay, so this is very different from, from the bishop lists we get from Irenaeus and Tertullian, late second century, where you're a hundred years after the events in question, you're in a different geographical region. Irenaeus is not in Rome. He's uh, probably getting his records uh, from maybe Pope Eleutherus in the, in the 170s. I've suggested in other contexts. I think that's a reasonable view. But in any way, he's getting them very indirectly. He's not an eyewitness, or nor is he close to the eyewitnesses. He's being given information well after the fact, in living in a different context. And you also have contradictions. So in the Gospels, I would argue you get a very harmonious picture. It's a very trustworthy picture. Um, different styles, different emphases, different theological conclusions drawn at times, sometimes differences in the details, but pretty compellingly coherent and unified for the four Gospels. The bishop lists are not, you know, at the very start, like who's the first bishop of Rome? And does it start with Peter or Peter and Paul together? You get uh, discrepancies between Irenaeus and Tertullian, for example. Is it Linus or is it Clement? And is it Peter and Paul together in, uh, initiating the episcopate with Linus, or is it Peter, who's the first bishop, and then he's someone succeeds him as the next bishop? So you have all kinds of discrepancies like that. So the point is, this is not comparable to higher critical biblical scholarship that's unduly skeptical for us to be skeptical of these bishop lists and to follow the evidence that we have from the first century and from the early second century. So all of that is in the spirit of saying, Based upon, how, as I keep reviewing this issue, I'm, I'm really convinced that the Episcopate is a development, and I would like to propose that as we keep working at this and we have dialogue, Protestant to Catholic, Protestant to Orthodox, which I've been doing more lately, we, we hone in on this question, which I think is the most interesting question between options two and three that I listed. 
Is it an institution that has a divine backing, or is it an institution that may be legitimate and appropriate but lacks Ura Divino? That's where I think is the most interesting question. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hope this video was of interest. And uh, even if you don't agree, hopefully we can have a good dialogue about it. And I'll hopefully have some more coming out about baptism as well as some other discussions uh, in July. So you can look out for those. Hey, thanks for watching.